1835, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana took over the Mexican government, his own Mexican government, which was a federalist government where most of the power was in the states, and installed a centralist government with himself in charge. So basically what this said was that most of the power would be in Mexico City and very little power would be in the states. This is obviously going to upset a lot of Texans because for the past at least five years, but even going before that, Texans had been pushing for separate statehood from Cohila. So they wanted to make sure that continued Anglo immigration, there have been limitations on that. They wanted to make sure that uh, we can reinstate slavery, get uh, further immigration of slaves. Uh, but as we had talked about, with Santa Ana taking over and putting the authority in Mexico City, this made statehood irrelevant. Essentially, even if Texas became its own state, it wouldn't matter because Santa Ana could override anything the state government came up with. So this is obviously going to upset a number of Texans in 1835. We've already had issues between the American Texans and the Mexican government. And so what you're going to see in late 1835 is a lot of discussions throughout Texas. So we've got these various colonies of these Americans throughout here. They're going to have to decide how should we react to uh, Santa Ana taking over and centralizing authority around himself. Well, there's going to be debates in all the various uh, colonial houses, you know, in San Felipe de Austin, Gonzales, a number of these uh, newer cities that had just popped up in Texas. And you're going to have people debating, what should we do? How should we react to the centralization of authority? Well, there's going to be some in Texas after Santa Ana's takeover that we're going to call the Peace Party. So these Peace Party uh, group, what they're going to argue is that we don't need to be fighting anybody. This is just another blip on the radar. What will happen very soon is what's happened previously uh, when Mexican government has been overthrown. Somebody's going to come along and overthrow them again. So we saw it uh, initially when Mexico got independence, overthrew Spain, installed a centralist government under Iturbide. Iturbide was then overthrown, federalist government put in place under the Constitution of 1824. Uh, there were a couple other smaller overthrows uh, within this time period uh, going up to 1832. Uh, uh, and then we had 1832, uh, Santa Ana. In 1833, Santa Ana is going to lead a federalist revolt, overthrow the government, and then soon there after he's going to overthrow his own government and install a centralist government so this peace party basically argues there's no need to fight anything just wait I'm sure a federalist government uh, federalist politicians in Mexico City will overthrow Santa Ana then we can apply for statehood so once they start fighting we'll start fighting too and then uh, even if that we not, might not even need to fight and then once the federalist government comes in place we'll get statehood and everything will be fine so there's a good chunk of Texans, and this is particularly the very uh, the people that have been there for a very long time, don't want to lose their plantations and everything they would built up to, to this point. They're going to say, let's not do anything. Let's, um, let's wait until Santa Ana is overthrown. There's going to be a sizable chunk of Texas, and this is going to be both Tejanos and uh, some of the Americans who are going to say, we need to go to war. and You're going to hear this called the War Party. So the War Party says we need to actively fight Santa Ana's government. This is uh, oppressive, you know, the centralist government isn't what we, uh, uh, type of government we can live under. And so some people are going to advocate for fighting. But the thing is there's going to be divisions within this War Party. So Peace Party basically says let's wait this out, let's hold out, not, no fighting. War Party says let's fight Santa Ana. But the goal for this war party will be different from one group to the next. So some long-term residents in the Tejano residents of Texas predominantly are going to call for, uh, those who are calling for war are going to say, we want to fight Santa Ana's government, but we want to fight for restoration of the Constitution of 1824, this Federalist Constitution. So when Santa Ana had taken over, he'd gotten rid of the Constitution of 1824 again, which was a Federalist Constitution, put the power in the states, and installed authority around himself. So some Texans, and again, particularly the Tejanos, say we should remain under Mexico. We're um, Mexican. This is a, we, we declared loyalty to the Mexican government. We should still be Mexican, but we should fight for the Constitution of 1824 and separate statehood. 
So that's going to be part of the war party. Guys like Erasmus Seguin will be in this uh, war party. Others in Texas, uh, will, this is going to be particularly a lot of these new arrivals, people that had only showed up in the past couple years, a lot of people that had showed up illegally without colonization contracts, had not bothered to become Catholic, learn Spanish, anything like that. They're going to call for fighting against Mexico, fighting against St. Anna's government. But instead of fighting to stay in Mexico and a restoration of the Constitution of 1824, They'll want to fight for independence, to break away from Mexico, either to break away from Mexico to become an independent state, an independent nation, maybe a Republic of Texas, or for independence and then to join the United States. And this is going to be particularly true of those new, new arrivals. Tejanos, um, they're not going to be uh, particularly happy about that group calling for independence. A lot of the old timers had learned to live under uh, Mexico and they think they, they can stay under Mexico. So the general sentiment in Texas is going to be, again, 1835. It's going to vary, and we're going to see it go one direction towards the end of 1835. But uh, the prevailing sentiment will be that we need to fight Santa Ana. We need to actively fight them. Uh, but again, there's no uh, consensus among the various groups. So something will begin to happen in towards the end of 1835 that's going to convince many Texans that peace is not an option and the war party is is right and we need to go to war. Um, one of the things that's going to happen that will push these peace party Texans to uh, the idea of fighting Santa Ana will be the return of Stephen F. Austin. So Stephen F. Austin is going to be released from imprisonment in 1835. He'll return to Texas when he returns to Texas, he's going to be angry. Obviously, he's mad that he's been thrown in jail. Um, again, he had he'd said we should have uh, go ahead and form our own state government. Basically, he talked about the chaos within the Mexican government. Well, when he arrives back in Texas in uh, late 1835, September 1835, what Stephen F. Austin will say is, I'm tired of dealing with the Mexican government. I've tried. I've been doing this for um, over 10 years at this point. And I've seen the chaos that happens. It's constantly flipping back and forth from one person to another. I've actively tried to learn Spanish. You know, he has learned Spanish very well. Um, I tried working with the governments, but this is chaos. Stephen F. Austin constantly been working with Tejanos, been very friendly um, to the local Mexican government and tried working within the um, central Mexican government uh, within their their bounds of what they want him to do but by 1835 he's frustrated Stephen F. Austin again this guy friendly to Tejanos he's gonna make some pretty awful comments about Mexicans in general something that you had never seen before with Stephen F. Austin he's angry and I guess you can you can somewhat understand if you'd been in prison for a year uh, and he's gonna come back and you would maybe regard him as one of the think without this imprisonment he might be on the peace party side but because of the imprisonment he's gonna come back and say we need to fight. We need. We can't deal with this anymore. And he's even going to be calling for independence, which is something that, again, uh, as we'll see, not a lot of the old timers will be calling for. So this is one thing that's going to push the Texans towards the idea of war. Another thing that's going to happen is Santa Ana will begin uh, pushing back against other um, other areas of Mexico that had called out his government or had basically said we're going to fight uh, Santa Ana. So when Santa Ana took over in 1835, you saw a lot of states, particularly states like the Yucatan, New Mexico, Chihuahua, states that are far from Mexico City that like federalist government because being distant from Mexico City, Mexico City can't proper de properly deal with the problems on the frontier. So these uh, far-flung areas when Santa Ana had to, uh, put the centralist authority in in place, they said, "We're breaking away. We're in revolt against. Uh, we're in revolt against the Mexican government." Uh, the closest one to Mexico City to say this was Zacatecas. Well, in 1835, Santa Ana will decide, "I can't deal with all these uh, these uh, you know rebelling uh, states just yet, but I'm going to deal with Zacatecas. Zacatecas is incredibly rich, close to Mexico City." So Santa Ana is going to march on Zacatecas in April 1835, where you, you have these politicians basically saying we're fighting against Santa Ana. He personally leads an ar army into Zacatecas. He's going to gather the re revolutionary leaders, defeat them in battle, and then he's just going to start massacring them. Now there's different numbers you'll sometimes see. 
he kills people into thousands, uh, but uh, I think the general consensus is a couple hundred people. Whatever the case, he essentially murders people who are in rebellion against him, and he even murders people that were sort of on the edge of rebellion. It was almost what er like what Arredondo did in 1813. Anybody that supported the revolutionaries or worked with the revolutionaries, Santa Ana will have killed or, or will take their property, something like that. So this is going to get a lot of people in Texas saying, all right, since some of us are calling for rebellion uh, and fighting Santa Ana, that basically means all of us because by nature, just being by uh, those who support rebellion, Santa Ana is going to regard us as all rebellious. So we need to all go in and begin to fight them. So this is going to convince some in the peace party to go to the war party. Another thing that is going to... Um, uh, bring the attention and, or push some people towards war in 1835 is that Santa Ana will send his brother-in-law, a guy named Antonio Coss, we'll, we'll talk about him very shortly, uh, to Texas with reinforcements for San Antonio. And basically people see this as he's sending soldiers up there. Uh, he's going to try to use these soldiers to um, you know, put us down. What happened in 1813 might, might be about to happen again. So again, this is going to push some more people towards war. He's already getting soldiers to put up uh, here in Texas, so uh, who knows what's going to happen next. Probably the biggest factor that's going to push the Texans towards war is going to be this outbreak of violence in this place, Gonzales, right here, uh, very close to San Antonio. So in October 1835, the uh, commander in charge of the forces in San Antonio will decide, he's a supporter of Santa Ana, he's going to decide that I want to, if these guys, I hear them talking about possibly revolting, if they do revolt, I want to make sure they're not very well armed. And one of the things that the people of Gonzales has that could potentially be used against the Mexican government is a cannon. The, um, the, the soldiers at San Antonio had allowed the people of Gonzales to use this small cannon to deal with Indian attacks. Gonzales is right at the edge of Comanche and Apache territory and it faced another number of Lipan Apache and Comanche raids and so in order to better fight the Comanches and Apaches the commander had given them this small cannon uh, to fight back against them. Well in October 1835 the commander decides I'm gonna get this cannon back because uh, again um, I don't want them to use against us in case of uh, re revolution. So on October uh, first or very end of uh, September, but the the act is going to happen at the very beginning of, of October, these cavalry, about 100 Mexican cavalry, will arrive at the edge, edge of Gonzales to um, to retrieve this cannon. Well, unfortunately for them, there's a they have to cro cross the uh, Guadalupe River to get to Gonzales, but at the time, the Guadalupe happens to be uh, a lot of rain, it's overflowing, and they can't cross until the next day. October 2nd. So the people of Gonzales, they see these Mexican soldiers camping on the other side of the river and they're going to determine, all right, what do we do? They got these soldiers coming to us. Should we give back this cannon? Well, no, let's decide to fight. So call's going to go out for all locals who don't want to give up this cannon, who don't want to, you know, give in to these Mexican forces. Um, uh, the militia will be gathered. And what's going to happen on October 2nd, about 150 men gather the river goes down enough for the Mexican cavalry to, to come across, and what they're going to be greeted with is a flag put together by the people of Gonzales that says, come and take it. So essentially, if you want our cannon, you can have it, but you got to come and take it from our hands. Well, uh, the cavalry will come in, the people, uh, the militia gathered here will fire on them, killing about one or two of the Mexican cavalry. The rest are going to sort of run off, like, oh, we just want our cannon back. And as they run off, the... Um, the militia will be firing behind them. None of the militia men were killed. So they run back to San Antonio and basically they're going to report these guys are fighting us. They're an open revolt. So now we have actual fighting between the Mexican government and the people of Texas. Uh, and by the way, this is the cannon here. You, you sometimes uh, you see the flag and you know Texans are so attached to this come and take it flag that uh, you know you almost think this is a huge cannon but this is a very small cannon it's a very small caliber uh, this is a picture of what it looks like today it's in, on display in the museum in Austin 
All right, so now we have fighting between Mexican forces and uh, the citizens of Texas. Stephen F. Austin's calling for war. And again, um, uh, Santa Ana has just violently put down the rebellion in Zacca, Texas. Well, this is going to get all the prominent leaders in Texas to decide in November 1835, we need to do something. So imagine letters being written between Stephen F. Austin's colonies, Green DeWitt's colonies, all these various colonies. They'll say, hey, send your prominent officials, send all the prominent men, the most successful men, the people that are going to speak for you. We need to figure out what we got to do. Well, this meeting is going to take place on November 1st, 1835. You'll hear it sometimes referred to as the Consultation of 1835. They're going to discuss the latest developments, fighting with Gonzalez, Zacatecas, things like that. And they're going to say, what do we do? We need to settle this once for all. We're going to go for peace. If we're going to go for war, are we going to go for war to fight to stay in Mexico, fight against Santa Ana for a federalist government, or are we going to fight for independence? Again, the arguments will go back and forth. You know, a handful of people are still going to be for peace, but they're in a minor vast minority by now. Most people are going to be arguing about whether to fight for independence or fight to stay within Mexico. Well, Consultation of 1835 will determine we are going to fight, and we're going to fight to stay in Mexico. So they will determine we're fighting not for independence, but for return to the Constitution of 1824 and separate statehood for Texas. So we're still going to be loyal to Mexico, which is we want to be under a federalist government. Well, in order to run things until uh, you know federalist forces can get back in, in, in power, what they're going to decide is we're going to go ahead and form our own state government separate from Cohila. And by the way, there's a whole conflict over in Cohila because there's a lot of people that want to be loyal to Santa Ana there. Some who want to, um, you know, stay stay Federalists or fighting for the Constitution of 1824. So the Texans say, you know, forget any prospect of even working with the Cohila Texas government. We're going to form our own state government. So they write up essentially a very quick state constitution and you can tell it's really quick it's it's very dysfunctional there's no separation of power between the executive and legislative branches um, and, and basically it's in order to get anything done you gotta have a, a super consensus and you gotta have um, the way they set up this council to make decisions is gonna lead to constant disputes and so they uh, form this just backwards state government. Uh, the guy that's going to be in charge of this state government, again, it's an unofficial state government, does not you know, have Mexico's approval, certainly not Santa Ana's approval. Uh, the guy that's going to be in charge of it is this Henry Smith guy. All right, so we got this consultation. We're forming the state government. Henry Smith, you're now in charge of it. We're fighting. Well, how are we going to get money to fight? That's the next question that's going to come up. So we're fighting for separate statehood, staying in Mexico, fighting at Santa Ana. How do we get uh, money to fight them? Because we're going to need firearms. We might need uh, a standing army. We'll talk about that in a second. All this requires money. You need to pay soldiers. You need to pay for cannons, ammunition, uh, uh, gunpowder, stuff like that. One of the things they're going to do is decide to send Stephen F. Austin to the U.S., all right, Stephen, go out there. What you, what you we want you to do is go to wealthy individuals, you, you know, people in New Orleans, places like that. Ask them to borrow money. You know, maybe sell land in Texas if it requires it. We need cash to pay soldiers. So Stephen F. Austin will set off towards the United States. Um, um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about him coming back in a second, but uh, he he will be off for a little bit to gather money. Um, now, the, the rest of the consultation, they're going to start writing back to their locations in Texas. So, you know, you over here, you over here. Um, start forming militias because we're preparing to fight. So we'll see letters go out from the consultation where people tell their people to start arming themselves because we're going to be fighting against Santa Ana's government. Next thing the consultation of 1835 will do is decide to form a, uh, st an, an army for Texas. So if Santa Ana comes, militias are great. We can have Joe Schmo fighting, we can have so-and-so fighting, but uh, but we need trained men. Militias are not trained. And militias, if you're not paying somebody, they can just leave whenever they want. You want something where you put somebody's name on contract, they have to stay as part of the army for a long time, and they have to put up with the BS that comes with the military. they got to, um, you know, 
basically train. They got to stand together. They've got to do the things again that militia, just guys that grab their gun and get off the couch, are not willing to do. So they form a, a professional army here at this consultation of 1835. And the guy they're going to decide to put in charge of this new army is a Sam Houston guy. Well, we'll be talking about Sam Houston a lot in the future, but Sam Houston is a politician from Tennessee. Um, he had experience in the War of 1812. He'd fought in the Creek War uh, under Andrew Jackson. Uh, Andrew Jackson became a prominent politician, eventually president of the United States. Houston had had disagreements with Jackson in the past, but was pretty close to, to Jackson, which is a lot of people point out maybe one of the reasons that they're picking Sam Houston. Maybe you can get some U.S. military help. Jackson's president of the United States at the time. Uh, but basically they think this guy is uh, has military experience and he just served as governor of Tennessee. Um, There's some political shifts in the United States at this time. Uh, Houston was essentially voted out as governor of Tennessee and he decided Texas is this new place, you know, new people are going there. I'm going to remake my political career in Texas. Shows up there just as um, Santa Ana is taking over the uh, government and centralizing authority around himself, and we have this revolution. So you come to Texas to remake your career as a politician, he was thinking, but now he's going to be coming here making it as a general because they, the consultation say, Sam, you are now the head of this professional army. So now Sam Houston has to gather together forces and prepare them to fight off Santa Ana should he march on Texas like he did on Zacatecas. So Sam Houston, you're head of the army. First problem comes up, well, where is my army? There's no professional army, so you need to get soldiers. Um, this is going to be a big issue. Well, where's my money? Well, Stephen F. Austin, he's riding people into the United States. He's prepping for a trip to the U.S., uh, maybe he can, um, he, maybe he can um, uh, get some men for your army. You know, until then, Sam Houston's got to be scrabbling together as much money as he can, start getting people to join his military, which is going to be tough because if you're somebody in Texas that wants to fight against Mexico, you know, you, there's you're going to just join a militia because you can take off if things turn turn bad. Most people in Texas have plenty of land except for a lot of these newcomers. And, and by the way, that's going to be one of the things that Sam Houston can offer is land and service in, 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 um, if they serve in this Republican Army, or, or I'm sorry, this uh, new professional army in Texas. So here, here's a little bit of land if you want to join this. But again, if you fight in this army and this revolution doesn't go right, Texas doesn't become a separate state, you're not getting that land anyway. So it's a Sam Houston basically is going to have a very slow, difficult time recruiting his men. Uh, so Sam Houston, that's one of the things he's going to do. Another thing he's going to do is start forming a general plan for uh, uh, for fighting. So the Mexican army may be coming. And by the way, the Mexican army, there's soldiers up here in Nacogdoches. There's a handful of soldiers here in Goliad. And by this point, Santa Ana's uh, brother-in-law, uh, uh, Cos is, uh, I'm sorry, Martin Perfecto de Cos has arrived here in San Antonio uh, with additional forces. Well, Sam Houston is initially thinking maybe we should just back off this area uh, and then sort of go where most of the Americans are, start forming an army over here, and then just maybe push once we get an army together. But as we're going to see, militia are going to have a different idea. So again, militia are just dudes off their couch. They'd heard that there, there's a fight against Mexico. And a number of these militia men had gathered around San Antonio. Well, Houston will call on these men. Hey, you guys, we should back off. We shouldn't directly fight the army until we get a professionals together. You guys can come join my professional army, but I don't think we should fight them. Well, this militia, they have no reason to listen to Sam Houston. Again, he's a member of this professional army. Uh, and none of these guys are... Uh, these guys are all just militia. So what they're going to do is decide, well, forget you, Sam Houston, and you know uh, we're going to go ahead and take San Antonio ourselves. And so in December 1835, we'll see this militia will surround San Antonio. It's actually interesting. S Stephen F. Austin initially is going to be in charge of this militia, uh, but nobody listens to Stephen F. Austin. He's not, he's not a general. He's a 
a politician and uh, uh, a businessman, basically, uh, after it quickly realizes he's not doing anything effective, this is when he finally goes to the U.S. and starts, uh, you know, getting uh, funds for the revolution. But we have these militiamen, again, Texas militiamen, surrounding San Antonio, uh, and they're going to try to rush uh, Costa's forces, so about three to 500, but Costa's forces, a lot of these professionally trained soldiers will drive them back a number of times. Eventually, a guy named Ben Milam. So, just imagine Costa's forces occupying San Antonio. And by the way, it's kind of interesting. At this point, this is where most of the Tejanos are living in San Antonio or near or in um, La Bahia. Just changed its name to Goliad uh, for uh, political reasons we can't get into. But most Tejanos are in these two areas. They're in kind of a weird place. Again, most uh, Tejanos educated who understand the political situation um are don't like Santa Ana and they don't like the fact that his brother in law came in here and, and they would like separate statehood, but at the same time they're getting a little bit nervous about these Americans and they're hearing this talk about independence. So th those in San Antonio, a lot of them are just sort of staying away from things. They're it's almost like they remember back to what happened in eighteen thirteen and realize if we take sides, then whoever wins we're gonna get punished for it. So let's just sort of stand in the background. Uh, again, you do have a lot of Tejanos that are going to be supporting the fight against uh, uh, Sa Santa Ana. Um, guys like uh, Erasmo Seguin and his son Juan Seguin. But a lot of Tejanos are just sort of standing back. Well, now you have this uh, American Texan militia around here. And you have uh, uh, Koss occupying San, An uh, San, San Antonio with his forces. Well, after these uh, militias been driven back a couple times... A uh, guy named Ben Milam, he'd actually been one of the impresarios alongside uh, Stephen F. Austin. Uh, on December 5th, 1835, he's going to say, who's going to follow old Ben Milam into San Antonio and basically call on the militia, hey, forget them driving us back, we need to push forward, let's get uh, these Mexican soldiers out of Texas. And Ben Milam and the Texans, here's General Cost, will rush General Cost's forces in San Antonio when they do, uh, Ben Milam's promptly shot in the head, and he dies, but the militia will end up taking Koss, they'll take him prisoner, and they'll take the, the rest of the Mexican soldiers in San Antonio prisoner. At this point, after this, uh, this battle, there's a painting of the battle, they're going to be rushing over, things like that. Uh, they capture it December 5th, 1835. They're going to tell Koss, if you want to stay here, you've got to get out. You know, you have to take your soldiers, you have to march south of the Rio Grande River, and we want uh, you to leave Texas. Uh, so basically, go tell Santa Ana that Texas is now its own separate state and we're fighting for the Constitution of 1824. Well, um, after this, Koss will promise not to return to Texas and he and his soldiers will march out of San Antonio. Uh, and the militia will come in to occupy it. Uh, this uh, Newspapers will start spreading the news of this throughout Texas. News will reach the United States, things like that. All right, so they've occupied uh, Texas, and it's interesting because just right before this, uh, we had seen American Texan forces attack uh, Nacogdoches and Goliad. Uh, this is where uh, the sizable portion of the Mexican soldiers who were loyal to Santa Ana, uh, this is where they were at, uh, again, Nacogdoches and Goliad. Uh, there's not any major fighting in these areas, just um, uh, Americans surround the forts where the soldiers are at, and they take them over. So what all this means is that by December 1835, uh, going into January 1836, basically Texas is free of Mexican soldiers. Now, it's interesting, a couple soldiers defected to those fighting um, against Santa Ana, but those who are loyal to them are now out of here. So what's going to happen now? Does this mean we're now a separate state? You know, some people say, well, since we uh, pushed the government out, uh, maybe we should declare independence. And as we're going to see, a lot of problems will start to pop up. Uh, but fortunately, or at least for the uh, Texans think this is fortunate, they think, well, we've got time because it's winter and people don't generally campaign during the winter. So we can figure out what direction we're taking this thing. We have a couple months before Santa Ana can get up here. But as we're going to see, that is not going to be the case.